So um, we had a very exciting discussion uh, called 2020 Vision, the Future of Online Safety. Um, I'd like to introduce Larry Magid, who's a technology journalist and an internet safety advocate. Uh, he's been uh, advocating for decades. Um, uh, he's CEO and co-founder of ConnectSafely.org and an on-air technology analyst for CBS News. Uh, Robin Raskin, also a tech journalist, is a founder of Living in Digital Times, a team of technophiles who bring together top experts and the latest innovations to look at the intersection of lifestyle and technology. So welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for the very lively discussion we had uh, earlier today. Uh, as you can see, there was a lot of activity. Uh, those uh, sheets that are posted up there reflect a lot of the thoughts. We threw a lot against the wall, um, and some of it stuck. We have um, For immortality. Uh, what was there? The the discussion was um, very interactive. A lot of participation among the people who attended. Were there any general themes? Uh, there was so much covered. Was there an overarching theme? Yeah. There were a couple, but I'll take um, the first one, and it came with a simple question I asked. I said, so if you had to look at social or at tech, which one do you think is going to have more influence? And everybody felt these were so, it was a unanimous that you cannot tease out a solution that will either be technical in nature or social in nature. And I think it's been reinforced through the day that all hands on deck, that this is going to involve multiple things happening. Um, and continually changing. That, that technology will get better in solving problems, but people will still be a necessary element. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Okay. Anything else? Well, another has to do with the whole notion of regulation. Um, many of us in this room, I, I'm not all of us, but many of us in this room, have been very cautious about advocating for government regulation, worried that the government will over-regulate, will poorly regulate. And I think many of us still have that worry, but I think it's inevitable that by 2020, we're going to be talking about regulations that are already in place, that are not in place today. Uh, it is clear to me that we are going to be entering a new regulatory environment. And unlike some of the early regulatory attempts, like the Communications Decency Act, I have a feeling this one's going to stick, that there is going to be things like starting with the uh, Honest Ads Act and, and other regulatory regimes, uh, because whether it's true or not, I think that the technology community is now perceived of having not taken care of its own house and having not done an adequate job in regulating itself. So uh, unless things change, I'm sure we'll be talking about that in 2020. Yeah, well, I think the lesson is that in 2020, we have to look at what has happened. Can we self-correct right. before regulation? The way this administration moves, probably. Um, and, uh, but it's time to self-correct quickly. But we have we just over a thousand days between now and 2020. But we yeah. can no longer oh, yeah. operate. See, I can't wait for 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Button. We can no longer operate in a silo either. That's right. In the U.S. now with GDPR, the bar is being raised higher. There was some discussion about uh, trying to harmonize regulation around the world, although I think that's a, an awfully lofty goal. Yeah. Um, certainly companies that operate globally today are going to want a common standard on which to base their business practices. Um, and, and the only thing we've seen so far is COPPA is sort of a common standard, not necessarily by law, but because the companies are enforcing U.S. law. But we're going to see more of that, I think. Will COPPA get updated once again? We sure hope so. <laughs> okay. I think, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think the big change, and it, it's everybody's problem now. It's not just keeping your kids safe. It's keeping democracy safe, the world safe, your companies safe. Um, and um, it's so another you're saying that we should all be kicked off Facebook. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, well, at least they have a time. At least get the information. No, and people talked about this this morning. Uh, we, we'll talk about identity, but knowing what people are taking from you. I, I talked about the concept of you are a product on social networking. You are the product that is being used to sell ads to people like you or unlike you, and. When you understand that, when kids understand that, and parents don't understand it, um, it's easy to see how you can be compromised and yeah. taken advantage of, which brings us to, the, I think, the single thread, other than there is no one silver bullet, was education. Mm -hmm. And um, we had very vocal and wonderful um, educators who reminded us 
um, that uh, kids are, are not um, born digitally savvy and that they do need guidance and they do need um, digital liter literacy, that we're seeing the beginning of effects of a digital age, attention deficit disorder, addiction to your mobile devices, immediate gratification needs. I mean, you do everything. You date by flipping through, you know, swiping. I mean, there's nothing you can't do by swiping um, anymore. And that teachers uh, were, um, we're adamant that um, kids really need this um, uh, digital literacy and a framework of, of civility and, yeah. and guidance. And by the way, on that subject, if I see one more ad for Jitterbug, the phone that's easy enough for seniors to use, I'm going to pull out my gray hair because the fact is that my generation invented the cell phone and that just because somebody may be 16 years old doesn't mean they know more about technology than the people in this room. That is a myth, here, here. especially when it comes to actually knowing how to create and program the technology. There was some discussion about long-term impacts of um, more and more screen time and uh, social media and the influence it has on children and what long-term effects that has on attention or productivity or, and um, I don't know if you have anything well, to add to that. I think by 2020 we'll see better research and hopefully we'll see some debunking of sort of urban myths that have been created of late because it's very popular to write stories about how these gen today's generation is going to hell in a handbasket. And I think some of this kind of pop science that we're seeing, even though some of it's coming from academics with right. good credentials, is going to be demystified. But at the same time, I think we will see better research from neuroscientists and others that will get us a better sense of what is the long-term impact of all this exposure. Yeah. No. I, I just lost nothing, my train of thought. Nothing but more to add on yeah, that. Well uh, done. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, another topic of significant discussion was the was data security and uh, identity and what uh, how private will our data be? How much trust will consumers have that their data uh, will be private? I mean, certainly there have been plenty of breaches, and um, will that get better? There was a bit of skepticism or cynicism uh, in our room. I think that many people in the room are very, very concerned about data security. One of the points that uh, one person brought up is, should we abandon the social security number as an identifier? And everybody said yes. But then he said, but what's going to replace it? Well, maybe something worse from a privacy standpoint, a national identity card, which some people think is a horrible idea. So a lot of debate about this, but I think it was a generally agreed upon the data security will be an even bigger issue than it is now. It's already a huge issue. Yeah, and, and, and who owns your data and can touch what parts, whether your job can use personal data to discriminate, you know, if you, you know, we know that there are job programs that uh, reward you for using your Fitbits, but what happens when they say, oh no, you can't, you can't get a job here, you haven't done enough Fitbit walking is a, is a problem. Um, well, you're driving too fast and you can't get, get, auto, get automobile insurance or you're buying too much ice cream and you can't get health insurance. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this data identity, and I actually ur urge everybody, and I've been doing this a long time, I'm telling you, look at the blockchain as a partial answer to this moving forward, and it won't be there by 2020, but um, the idea of owning pieces of your data that you can make public to different entities is fundamentally as big as the internet itself. Is that a grandiose statement? But whatever, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to give us some peace of mind when it comes so, to privacy. So put Robin identity. down for a seminar on blockchain in 2020. Yeah. She's, well, she speaking, just volunteered. Speaking of technology, what yeah. will, be, will we uh, be focusing on in 2020? So we bandied about a lot of ideas um, in, in our session, um, artificial intelligence, Augmented reality, virtual reality, voice assistance, gesture, biometrics, you know, facial recognition, vo eye recognition, and whatever, ingestibles, wearables, and whatever it was, I think the conversation quickly led to one conclusion, double-edged sword. The good things about it and the bad things about it. And I think as one person put it pretty astutely that Devices where they become much more seamless in her and right now it's your phone and your mobile device and that's you. But you know your ring, your wearable, your um, embeddable, your attention band, your back band to tell you when your posture is straight. These things are going to become a part of our life. 
And not only are they going to be Internet of Things that you talk to, but they're going to be Internet of Things that talk amongst themselves. So okay. your, your, your Nest thermometer telling your um, laundry when to go on because it's optimal, and your uh, refrigerator reordering your supplies. And you're going to have a lot of Internet of Things issues but the whole notion of the Internet of Things may just fade into just being things. Now, you may have seen me put on earbuds, and you might think I'm listening to Spotify. But what I'm going to try to do is do a transnational cyberbullying. Let's see if this works. These, by the way, are the new Pixel earbuds that I think came out last week or maybe come out next week. I'm not sure. But uh, let me try them. Help me speak Italian. It's telling me it's opening Google Translate. Robin, you're stupid. Of course, it never works. And of course, I can't do my retort. Like, Larry, thank you for calling well, me beautiful. Well, it's supposed to be saying, <laughs> I'll try one more time. Robin, you're beautiful. Well, thank you for calling me stupid. <laughs> well, anyway. Well, you get it. Technology often doesn't work. Um, but the point is, it, it's supposed to work. And I really think that this will not only work by 2020, but it'll actually be really good by 2020. And it makes me wonder, yeah, it, it's printed it out, but it's supposed to say it. And we're supposed to be able to have a conversation in English and Italian. But my point is that it's going to make it a lot easier for us to reach out globally, which will be very, very good in the most part, but could also be bad. Uh, and I was reminded of this when our president referred to the leader of North Korea as, what, fat and short. And I'm thinking, that's transnational cyberbullying. He's doing it across borders. And he has no idea yeah. how it plays in North Korea. He, he's an equal time. Speaking of communication, um, what will email and text be the communication tools that we'll be using, or will we be using different sorts of communication? So how many of you work with young staffs? Um, when you put out an email because you think it's the journal of record, it's like, you know, they're not so happy about it. So, and yet texting is, is problematic for a lot of it. It sort of evaporates, which, um, I think when you're young, you expect things to eva evaporate, like like in, like Snapchat. Snapchat or. Uh, but I think that you're seeing collaborative new tools like Slacker and Trello and things to organize a team and keep a record of pulling conversations that will be much more facile than the email that we know today. And um, video conferencing will become the norm. Uh, and getting a transcript will be as easy as hitting a button of, of, of that video conference. And um, if anything, as we all know, we will all suffer from too much information, and the smart people in the room will be the ones that can analyze that information, which and we're probably doing a terrible job of, and hone it down to the specifics. And I think the technology will help us do that, will help us get to the gist of what we, we're looking at. Um, in terms of some of the problems that I see during that period, I love facial recognition, but I worry about it. And not just in the hands of government and Big Brother, but in the hands of ordinary citizen. If I can walk up to somebody on the street, aim my phone at them, and know everything there is to know about them, even though I, at the moment, don't know their name, that could be problematic. So we really need to be thinking ahead. I always think about if Henry Ford had only had a, auto, you know, a family car safety institute to go to back when he invented the Model T, maybe our roads would be safer and our cities wouldn't be so congested. So uh, let's hope that we can get ahead of some of these problems yeah, instead of suffer from them. So, so let's start talking about the good things to look forward to. Um, we've <coughs> talked a little bit about how we spent the last 10 plus years celebrating op the open internet and platforms that allow us to post and share. Um, and it seems that we're in somewhat of a self-correction period at the moment, and maybe 2020 will be a better place, a more civil place, a place where we can trust the sources. Yeah, uh, well, I think there was one wonderful person in the, in the room in the conversation who cautioned us not to forget what a celebration the internet really is in our lives. Um, as I remember my own kids telling me, I love it because you can talk to grandma without having to yell. And that, <laughs> you know, broke the boundaries of, of age. And I think um, it's remarkable. Old people, older people can stay connected. Communities are forming that have never been formed before. Um, it's opened up 
I'd like to thank you. My positive side, it's, it's lessened the economic gap, the gender gap. It's made us all more aware and less divisive on its good days. And um, so we really, and I think it's actually in a large part because people like Fosse realized um, that, that somebody had to protect this treasure. And I think watching the Cuba movie this morning, we saw this um, wonderful, it was like seeing the internet again through somebody else's eyes that we've forgotten. And so we can't forget, um, you know, what are we fighting for? Um, I think we can't forget that. And so in 2020, we should be celebrating some of these things too. As my mother always says, it could always be verse. <laughs> so so I, I absolutely agree with Robin. I think that the world is fundamentally better off today than it was 10 years ago when this conference first started convening or 20 years ago or so when the web became commercialized. But we've obviously seen some problems we never anticipated. As I joked in my pre-conference uh, blog post, uh, I, I really fault Stephen for not having predicted three years ago that the Russians would try to take over the U.S. Uh, in the 2016 election. I don't know why you missed that, Stephen. But the point is that we are just as likely to be missing something that will happen in 2020. So as yeah. smug as we may be at this, on this panel, there is going to be a lot that's going to happen that year that we simply cannot predict. But I also predict that there, the good stuff will continue to grow as well. And one of the things I'd like to suggest for your heart research uh, for the 2020 is to take a look at the internet and try to figure out, are we better off today than we were 20 years ago? And looking at all the variables and trying to account for things that have nothing to do with technology and figure out what the, the net total of the net has been. My prediction is that that research will show that by and large, that we are better off by most major ways that we can evaluate humankind. But we will find, of course, especially if you took this temperature today, that there are areas where we are not better off. But it would be really interesting to get a look at the totality of it all. And uh, you know, that's my bid for some future research. Do we have time for any questions or Two comments minutes. from the group, from the audience? Yeah. yeah? And anybody who is in our session that wants to chime in, feel yeah. free to. Robin, I, I love what you said that we need to protect this treasure. I, I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit. One thing that I was hearing is maybe we need to protect our humanity. Yes. We need to protect our belief in humanity and our vision for humanity. And the technology can't, can't really destroy that or diminish that. Is that what you meant? And that I, is, I think you can so, say it better. That is so, no, that is I couldn't say it better. But I do think to go back to Pat's point, this is the maturation point. You know, we've we've played around and we've tested and we've experimented, and it's really testing every norm we've ever known: centralization versus decentralization, um, giving power to you know everybody equally. It's it's tested every norm about age and learning and lifelong learners, and now we're at this this stage where uh, some big businesses and a lot of wealth have been created and we're not just like playing in DARPANET. Any, I mean, and I, I know they were protecting the country, but the stakes are, are rather large and um, the losses, and I, and I say this, if there is a technological backlash, which we really run the risk now, um, both in our workplaces and in our homes of there being, we are um, in a lot of trouble economically, socially, in terms of a democracy. So I think to recognize this, this gift, and if you look at emerging countries, if you look at what's going on in Kenya and in Pesa, and if you look at um, Africa and India and the treasures they found by giving a mobile phone to somebody in a small village, I think we have to capture that spirit again while maintain we're mature enough to keep safely. And I'd go so far as to say that means that the big players in this room need to play as one more than ever before to make it feel like, feel like a good place to be. Well, I certainly agree with that. I, I think it's time that the industry really start thinking about what is its responsibility as major leaders of our economy and of our democracy. The fact that Facebook had more people than practically any country, or do they now have more people than any country? I can't remember, I mean, two billion, more than two billion people. Uh, that's a huge responsibility. It's an enormous responsibility. The fact that Google essentially controls the way many people access much of their information, an enormous responsibility. In many ways, that makes these companies more powerful than governments. And unlike governments, we don't get to reelect their, their CEOs every four years. They've got to figure out a way 
that they can um, coexist um, and not simply keep the regulators off their back, but keep the American people on their side. Because I am sensing a bit of a backlash now. I don't want to be unfair. I still think that these companies, for the most part, are doing an incredible job. I would never want to go out back to card catalogs and having to pick up the phone every time I want to communicate with somebody. Believe me, I want my Facebook, I want my Google, I want my Twitter. But I also want to make sure that these, um, these institutions, which is what they're becoming, are beneficial and are at least mitigating the danger. They'll, they will never eliminate danger. You know, we have this event we do every February called Safer Internet Day. It's Safer Internet Day. We don't, we're not presumptuous enough to assume we will ever have safe internet. I think we can have safer social media, safer search, and a safer online world. So um, I, I'm, that's why I like the uh, Family Online Safer Safety Institute. <laughs> Put on, another S in there. And on that, that note, or do, is that, or is, is that time, what, time for one more? More question. Anybody else? Yeah, I think back there. Was there somebody there? No? Okay. So you, want, you want me to be like the last word? To, and this did not come from the group, but I predict as I sit here that by 2020, uh, something will be uh, divested the way AT&T was in the 80s. So you can come back in 2020 and tell me if I'm wrong or right, but that's my wild, wild card to close us out. Okay. And will Donald Trump still be president? Oh, I can't wait for 2020, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'd, I'd like to thank Larry and Robin and everybody who participated uh, in the discussion. It was very lively and we have a lot to look forward to uh, as well as uh, figure out. So thank you all. And I want you all back here three years from now.